really needs very little introduction. He's been absolutely really down to formation and easy gambling. Congratulations to uh, understand black things. And we can look on as that cosmology on moving mesh. So this is work I've been doing over the course of the past year or so, and it's involved a number of collaborators at Harvard, postdocs and students, including postdocs Shai Mel, Dushan Karanish, Deborah Shiashti, and Mark Vogelsberger, and a longtime collaborator by the Germany, Volker Springle, and students including Paul Flory and um, Dylan Nelson. So this is really a report mostly on work in progress. So if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me as I go along. But the goal is to try and develop a methodology where we can theoretically understand how galaxies form and evolve. So this is something that people have been trying to do for many decades now with only limited success. And there are many reasons for this. Ultimately, this is, this is really a computational problem. Analytic techniques and semi-analytic techniques can't really describe in detail the physics of what's going on to try to understand galaxy formation and evolution. And computationally, it's a very demanding problem for a variety of reasons. Right? We know the universe consists of both dark matter and gas. And this means that any computational approach has to be able to combine collisionless dynamics and gas dynamics together. Furthermore, there's a very large dynamic range involved in this problem. We want to model, say, scales that contain many many, many galaxies of order of hundreds of megaparsecs across, but at the same time describe what's happening within individual galaxies, and ultimately within individual regions where stars form within these galaxies. So there's a large dynamic range that needs to be modeled in both spatial scales, mass scales, and time scales. Furthermore, there are lots of processes going on that need to be accounted for at some level that we don't understand very well in particular how radiation interacts with matter, the different phases of the interstellar medium, and how star formation proceeds. On top of this, in a universe like ours, structure grows hierarchically. And so that means big objects were put together by little bits of pieces that developed earlier. And so if we want to understand something like this, it's not enough to be able to resolve scales characteristic of that object. We need to resolve all the little bits and pieces that came together earlier to produce it. Now, if we want to attack this computationally, it means that the basic approach that we have to use couples together n body dynamics and hybrid dynamics. So, n body to describe the dark matter and stars, and hybrid dynamics to describe the gas that stars form from. Now, n body techniques are not adapted. We can't take particles and split them up arbitrarily. And so the only solution to that problem is to use a very large number of particles to represent, say, the dark matter density field. However, it is possible to formulate hydrodynamic solvers that are adapted, and those are the techniques that have been used most popularly in trying to model galaxy formation and evolution. And so there have basically been two types of techniques that have been used in this field um, that, re that employing adaptive hydrodynamic solvers. And I wanted to briefly just mention the categories and then describe a new technique that we're going to be using, which is an attempt to combine the best features of these two traditional methods. So one technique is what's called the Lagrangian technique. And a particularly um, well-known example of that is what's called smooth particle hydrodynamics, or SPH. And the idea behind these techniques is to take a gas, a region of gas, partition it into fluid elements, and then represent those fluid elements computationally by particles. These particles move around in response to gravity and also local forces due to pressure gradients and viscosity. And so imagine that you have some gas to break apart these particles. These particles move around and describe the updated properties of the gas in the future. Another technique is based on what's called the Eulerian approach. And so the idea here is to put down a grid and then compute solve the fluid equations on this grid by calculating fluxes of mass, energy, and momentum between neighboring grid cells. Now this technique can be refined using an approach called adaptive mesh refinement, or, or AMR. And the idea is that if you want to achieve better resolution in some region, you start off with some base grid and then later put down a more refined grid in regions where you need higher resolution. And so these two techniques, or Larian, especially adaptive mesh refinement, 
and Lagrangian through smooth particle hydrodynamics have been used a lot in studies of cosmology in the past 20 years or so. It turns out these techniques have very complementary strengths and weaknesses. And I want to just mention a, a couple of problems with the two techniques and how the new method that we're using may eliminate some of these uh, long-standing issues. So one problem with the Lagrangian techniques like SPH is that they have difficulty resolving interfaces between different uh, types of fluids and instabilities that might develop there. So here's an example of this from a study from Haggard's in 2007. It consists of two regions of fluid that are shearing relative to one another. So the upper region is moving in that direction, the lower region like that. The two phases are pressure equilibrium but have different densities. And so what you expect to happen is that the region in between should be unstable to Calvin Hamill's type of stabilities. Okay, these two solutions here are going forward in time using um, a couple of grid phase techniques. And here's the solution gotten with smooth part of hydrodynamics. So you can see the instability here is suppressed, mainly because this method doesn't resolve discontinuities, contact discontinuities very accurately. And I'll come back to this later in my lecture. On the other hand, these adaptive net refinement techniques have typically been implemented with gravity solvers that are not very accurate and not very efficient. And that's a big problem in cosmology where structure grows through the action of gravity and furthermore it grows hierarchically. So here's an example of this from some work from O'Shea in 2005. What it shows is the halo mass function versus mass of redshift three. These were simulations done only with n bodies, so no hydrodynamics, just looking at the evolution of dark matter. The exact solution, or the solution that we know should be present, is given by the solid curve here. This short, long dash curve is what's gotten with a um, gravity solver that's in one of these SPH nodes. And then these dotted curves are what's gotten using one of these adaptive metric refinement codes. And even though this calculation here was quite expensive compared to the particle-based technique. You can see it doesn't match the halo mass function of low masses. And that's a problem if we need to resolve structure on small mass scales to describe what happens later as objects grow hierarchically. On top of this, there have been some limited attempts to compare different types of hydrodynamic techniques in cosmology, and those comparisons have yielded ambiguous results. So this is work from a well-known study that was done in 1999. What was done here was to compare the outcome of simulations looking at the formation of a single cluster of galaxies using a series of different hydrodynamics codes. Okay, this was a fairly restricted calculation but did not include radiative cooling, and so the gas was adiabatic except for the fact that it could shot heat. Some of these are uh, particle-based codes, others are grid-based codes, for example, this is a grid-based code, and so is that one. This one here is a particle-based code, and so is that one. You can see, in, at least looking at this just in, in density projections, the results are similar but not identical. And furthermore, if you look at these in more detail, there are systematic differences between the various types of codes, and I'll come back to this later. And in particular, if you look at the entropy profiles, it turns out that in the central regions, systematically, the entropy is higher using these grid-based codes than using particle-based techniques. And it hasn't been understood why that was the case for the past 13 years, but we think we have an understanding of what's happening now. And I'll come back to that later. So we're in a situation where the different techniques that have been used in cosmology have different strengths, different weaknesses, Comparisons between them yield ambiguous results, and so we'd like to see if something better can be developed. And so the technique that I'll talk about today is a hybrid approach that tries to combine together the best features of the Lagrangian and Eulerian techniques, and to the extent possible, eliminate as much as we can their weaknesses. And so the idea is to solve the hybrid <coughs> equations on a mesh, but to allow the mesh to move around with the fluid, so retaining many of the advantages of the Lagrangian technique. The particular um, approach that I'll talk about was developed by my collaborator, Volker Sprinkle. It uses an unstructured mesh to describe the fluid, and I'll show what that looks like in a second, and a tree code to compute gravitational forces, which is a very fast and efficient way of calculating gravity. 
The name of this code is Arapo. It's derived from a Latin palindrome, which is a phrase that's read the same backwards and forwards. And it's supposed to indicate that if you apply, say, a, a velocity boost to the system, you'll get the same answer regardless of the direction of that velocity boost, because the bridge is moves along with the fluid. The particular way that the fluid equations are solved are on an unstructured mesh. This is something that's been used a lot, especially in aerodynamics and plasma physics, but not so much in cosmology. And the kinds of things that we have to deal with in cosmology that aren't um, at play in these engineering fields are these very large dynamic ranges and the fact that gravity drives the evolution. Now, there were some attempts to do this in the 1990s, including um, a code that was developed by Wei Li, Nick Ned, and Guo Hangzhou. These didn't really have much impact in cosmology because of problems with mesh tangling, and I'll come back to that later, which this particular code avoids. And finally, there has been a, another um, independent code developed by Duffel and McFadden at NYU. It's very similar to the one that I'll talk about, but it was designed to look at different astrophysical problems and doesn't calculate self-gravity, so it's not useful for cosmology. Okay, so how does this technique work? It solves the Heidegger equations on a grid. The particular grid is used with what's called the Voinoi tessellation, and this is an example of what it would look like in two dimensions. So imagine putting down a set of points shown in blue, then space is divided up in 2D into these polygons. And it turns out that given an arbitrary distribution of these points, there's a unique way to divide space up into these polygons. And then the equations of motion are solved by calculating fluxes of mass, energy, and momentum across each interface between these cells. And so that can take advantage of fast and accurate hyper solvers that have been developed before in um, the Eulerian community. Now, the way that these points are laid out and the way that they're updated in time are completely arbitrary. And so this code can mimic, say, conventional static grid code where the points just sit there. But its most powerful implementation occurs if you allow these points to move around with fluid. And that way, the um, grid naturally adapts to the motion of fluid and concentrates the computing effort where it's most required. So let me show you an example of this. This is a very low resolution simulation. The checkerboard pattern is the grid initially. It shows a shearing flow where the flow is going in that direction on top, to the right in the middle, and to the left on the bottom. The interfaces are in pressure equilibrium, but the density varies between the blue and the red regions. And so as the fluid starts to move, the grid moves along with it, and you'll see if I can get this to work. So for some reason, this movie doesn't seem to be working. But what you would see is Calvin Hamlet's instability developing with these two interfaces and the grid moving around in response to the fluid. I'm not sure why it's not working today. Anyway, so let me just spend a, a few minutes talking about some of the detailed aspects of this code. If you have any questions about it, please interrupt and ask me about it. So this code has been developed to run in parallel using MPI. It uses multiple time stepping, which means that different regions are integrated on different time scales, which is essential for cosmolog cosmological applications. As I said, the hydrodynamic equations are, are solved by calculating fluxes across cells. It uses something called a Riemann solver, which allows it to resolve discontinuities, especially shocks, within one grid cell. And the particular details of how the equations are solved are based on what's called an unsplit muscle Hancock integrator. That particular choice means that the code is second order accurate in space and time, and so truncation errors scale like the uh, grid space of squared or the time step squared. The way that this technique was implemented was that Sprinkle wrote this on top of his well-known smooth particle hydrodynamics code, Gadget. And so this moving mesh code and Gadget shared the same gravity solver and the same treatment of any non-hydrodynamic physics, which makes it possible to do a very direct comparison between them. 
And a lot of my talk will be about the comparison we've done between these two techniques. Now, like I said at the beginning, this sort of um, code was attempted in the 1990s. Those efforts had a problem with the mesh becoming very irregular in time. And Arapo eliminates that problem using a technique called mesh regularization based on something known as Lloyd's algorithm. Right, so you can imagine if you just put the points down arbitrarily, you might end up with a mesh that looks like that. Some of these cells have very distorted shapes. For example, this one here, which is very long in one dimension and very short in another. That type of um, configuration is very inefficient because the time step would be limited by the shortest distance across the cell, which in this case would be that direction. And so what this code does is, as the fluid moves around, the points move with the fluid, but they're allowed to drift relative to the local fluid velocity. And if that's done in um, a particular way, then eventually a mesh that might look like that will evolve into something that looks like this, where the cells have roughly the same volume. And so this approach eliminates this problem with the moving mesh codes that were developed in the 1990s. In addition to the mesh moving around with the fluid, this code also has the capability of allowing the grid to be refined or de-refined locally. So, for example, suppose we had a grid that looked like that, and you decided that you want to have better resolution in that particular region. The way that would be done would be to eliminate this mesh generating point and add two on either side of the cell, basically splitting it in half. And so in that way, you would add a new grid cell that would refine locally um, the structure of the, the, the mesh. On the other hand, if there are regions where you didn't care about the solution any longer and you wanted to save computational time, you could eliminate cells simply by removing this mesh generating point. And then the next time the grid was generated, this cell would be absorbed into the surrounding cells like that. And so you could save computational time if there are regions where you didn't care about what was going on. This was interact with points and then you can find out each more the Yeah, so you um, have to do this in a particular way so that you don't end up with cells that are very distorted after you either remove or add grid, grid points to the, the mesh generating structure. But yes, yeah, so you have to be a little bit careful about how you do that. Now, one of the nice things about this kind of approach is that the structure of the mesh, the way that you set it up initially, is completely arbitrary. And so you can tailor the mesh to any particular problem that you might be interested in. So for example, if this is supposed to represent a face on an edge on view of a galaxy, in this particular case, the density of the mesh was tied to the density of the gas. And so the cells are very fine in the center where the gas density is high, but then much coarser when you get away from the galaxy where the gas density Low. Here's another example. One of my students was interested in looking at impacts onto the Earth. In this case, you don't really care about what's happening in the center of the Earth, and so you can represent that with a very coarse mesh. He was mostly interested in seeing what would happen near the crust in the atmosphere, and in that region, the mesh is so dense that you can't even see the individual cells in this particular configuration. So in this case, the density of the mesh cells is tied to the gradient of the density, not to the density itself. And so you can lay down whatever mesh you want in such a way as to best represent a particular problem that you're interested in solving. Now this type of technique has been used a lot in engineering, like I said before. And one reason for that is that it's very good at handling interactions between flows and solid surfaces even if those surfaces are moving around or changing their shape and time. And the way that that's done, and I'll show a video of this in a second, which hopefully will work this time, is that this is supposed to represent a solid surface that's moving around in the background fluid. The background fluid is represented by one of these boiling line meshes, so with time it would look like this. A part of the mesh is used to represent the solid surface, and in this case these cells are forced to move around um, rigidly together. And so at the surface, a boundary condition is applied so the fluid cannot penetrate into these cells that are supposed to represent the solid. And so in this way, one can represent solid surfaces accurately and even allow these solid surfaces to move around um, in the fluid. 
Okay, so this animation is supposed to show a solid surface that's like a spoon stirring up a bunch of fluid. And this fluid is contained in a box that has reflecting walls. Okay, it's colored differently in the top and the bottom, so you can see how the fluid mixes with time. And as the solid surface moves around, it generates vorticity at its um, edges. And you can see these eddies start to propagate through the fluid, mixing it up and um, causing the different parts of the fluid to be um, mixed together. Okay, this type of problem, even though it looks simple, is actually very difficult for conventional grid codes to tackle. Okay, it's hard to represent surfaces like this, especially ones that are moving around. And this kind of approach has been used in a variety of applications where fluids interact with uh, moving surfaces. So for example, there are people at NYU that have used this technique to look at the flow of blood through the human circulatory system. And there you want the blood vessels to be able to um, be elastic and move with time. And furthermore, you want the blood to be able to interact with the heart, which is pumping it through the circulatory system. And so you can imagine this kind of code is capable of doing that, whereas it would be very difficult to do this with something like a purely Lagrangian technique or um, one that happens to fix mesh. Yeah? So is it clear how you have to set up the grid to start, or would you try running the calculation with different starting grid systems? Uh, for something like this, you would start off with a grid that looked like um, this one up here on top. So the background grid would be um, regular, like in this example, because the fluid is uniform density to start with. And then you would just separate off part of the grid and use it to represent the solid surface, and that would move around. So these cells here would be moving together. They would, would move relative to one another. So the solid surface would maintain the shape of time. And then as things start to get stirred up, this background grid becomes more like this Voronoi tessellation that I described earlier. I feel like you showed the, when you were showing the Earth before, you said right. that like, sometimes you would want the, the alignment of the grid to, uh, to correlate with the gradient of the density rather yeah. than the density. So is there some like straightforward way to know how you should set it up before then? Or you so it really that? depends on what problems you're interested in looking at. You know, so he wanted to see what would happen if small impactors hit the surface and affected the crust in the atmosphere. And he didn't really care what was happening in the core because these impacts wouldn't be large enough to cause much damage to the core of the Earth. And so there you need to have very fine resolution on the outer parts so you can actually see how the crust and the mantle would react to these small impacts. And so just given the nature of the problem and what he was interested in, that gives you some idea of what how this grid should be constructed. Okay, this code has been subjected to a variety of tests to make sure that it works in the way that it's um, supposed to. And he wrote a, Springle wrote a very detailed paper about this two years ago, presenting a large number of these tests. And I don't want to go through those, but basically the code passed them all, including um, tests about convergence rates of those, the hydrosolver. More recently, one of my students at Harvard, Diego Munoz, has generalized this code to solve the Navier-Stokes equations. So originally it was just implemented to solve the Euler equations. And Diego has a paper on um, after a PH about this, where he subjected this new version to a number of well-known test problems in um, viscous fluid dynamics. I wanted just to mention one particular um, example, a case of isothermal shocks that developed using this code. And so this just shows a tube of gas where gas is directed towards the center from either direction. As the gas glides in the center, two outwardly propagating shocks develop. This is the solution um, gotten with this moving mesh code. This is the density versus position. And the only point is that the shock is resolved within one grid cell using this technique. Okay, there's some post-shock ringing here. This is a very early implementation of this code. And since then, the solution has been refined even further, and so the solution up here is more accurate now. This is the same uh, problem using smooth particle hydrodynamics using Springle's gadget code. And you can see the jump across these shocks is represented reasonably well. The blue curve is the exact solution. But because of the way that this code handles shocks, 
these socks are broadened over several resolution elements. And depending upon the problem, that can cause difficulty or be irrelevant, and I'll come back to that later on. But the basic message of this is that this moving mesh code is very good at resolving discontinuities accurately, whereas codes like um, gadget are not. Okay, so what, we, what we're working towards is developing a methodology to be able to study galaxy formation and evolution in a cosmological context. Like I said, something that people have been doing for more than 20 years now with fairly limited success. And we're not quite to the point where we can actually um, claim to solve this problem, but I want to describe what we think is an important step maybe in the right direction to getting a solution to this um, application. And so the immediate goal that we've been focusing on, and what I want to talk about today, is we've been doing detailed studies comparing this moving mesh code with the traditional version of smooth particle hydrodynamics implemented in this code called Gadget that Springle developed about um, 10 years ago. So the results of these studies are described in a number of papers on the archive, and I wanted just to highlight some of the um, comparisons and our attempts to understand why we see differences when we do. Now, these comparisons are quite difficult because there's no way that one can compare different codes like this holding everything the same between them. Right, so you can imagine comparing codes at, say, the same mass resolution, the same spatial resolution, for the same CPU and memory requirements, or maybe for the same accuracy of the solution. And with codes that's different, there's no way that one can compare them keeping all these things the same between um, these codes. And so what we've done in order to come up with a comparison that's fairly um, even-handed in a certain way is to compare the codes to roughly the same mass resolution. Okay, so we start off with calculations that have the same number of resolution elements, and then we evolve them forward in time and see what differences and similarities develop. Okay, there are a number of reasons why this is a good strategy. For one thing, we can use the same initial conditions, and then we can later compare the same objects in the two simulations to see whether or not we get similar or different results. It turns out that if we make the comparison in this way, that the two codes, Gadget and Arapo, have roughly the same CPU requirements. Um, this moving mesh code has recently undergone an overhaul. It turns out it's actually slightly faster now than um, this SPH code, Gadget even though it's significantly more complicated and provides a significantly more accurate result in the end. Right? Yeah? Uh, sorry. Uh, so at the same mass resolution, does that mean the gas mass resolution is also the same? Yeah. You can, so you don't refine? Uh, we do refine, but only to a limited extent. So we start off with the same number of Initially, there are the same number of dark matter particles and the same number of cells as SPH particles in the gadget simulation. And then we do subsequently a little bit of um, refinement in the gas phase with the moving mesh code, but not in the smooth particle dynamics code. But it turns out that you know, even with that, that this moving mesh code is slightly faster than the gadget in terms of the, the overall CPU cost. Okay, we could have tried to do a comparison like this at the same spatial resolution or the same accuracy of the solution, but it turns out that the convergence properties of smooth particle hydrodynamics are not well established. And so that sort of comparison would not be very well um, defined at this point. Also, when we identify differences, we have not tried to do a conversion study with SPH, again, because the proper way to achieve convergence is not well known with that technique. And finally, in this study, we've adopted a particular implementation of SPH, this code called Gadget that Springle wrote about 10 years ago. And that facilitates the comparison because the two codes use the same gravity solver and the same non-hydrodynamical physics, and so we can make this comparison in a fairly even-handed manner. Okay, so the sorts of comparisons that we've been um, doing have been based on a variety of um, astrophysical applications and idealized tests. Um, I'll mention briefly a comparison of a merger between two galaxies using these two techniques. And then later, a very idealized test that we've done to try and understand the differences that arise between the two codes. But most of all, what I'll talk about is based on cosmological simulations. 
like um, a section of one of the simulations shown here. And in these simulations, we've used relatively small boxes as far so 20 megaparsecs across based on WMAP7 cosmology. And we varied the resolution to see whether or not the results are significantly affected by that. So the number of particles and cells are varied between 128Q up to 512Q. So the highest resolution simulations are actually uh, have quite good mass resolution of boxes and small. These simulations, the cosmological ones, include cooling and star formation, but we ignore strong effects due to feedback that would drive outflows in the galaxies. So that's something that we want to include later. So we're trying to keep the um, non-hydrogenomical physics as simple as possible, just to identify differences in the outcome only due to the hydro solver. And we do use a sub-resolution model for the star forming gas within galaxies, but that's limited to the gas that collapses to high density and doesn't affect the surroundings. And the galaxies are, do not drive any outflows um, in these simulations. Okay, so I wanted to start just by showing an animation from one of these cosmological simulations. And what you'll see is a fly-through um, starting at Russia 1.9. And it will show different regions and the objects that develop in these different regions um, as the region is shown from different directions and different locations. So one thing you'll notice is that this is shown in projected gas density. So throughout, the simulation produces things that look like rotating disks of gas. And to date, there's been no other cosmological simulation which has produced a population of disk-like galaxies um, that have this sort of appearance. We see, in many situations, disks that are interacting with one another. All right, so basically, these are small groups that contain large numbers of um, disk galaxies. And again, it's showing the redshift going back to redshift zero. Here's an example of disk galaxies that are interacting with one another that might eventually merge to produce something that look, would look like an elliptical. A tidal feature is produced through these sorts of interactions. <coughs> and this sort of outcome, like I said, has never been achieved before in a cosmological context. So there have been some recent results with very high resolution zoom in simulations of individual objects, but there haven't been any simulations like this that have produced a large family of rotationally supported disks. So there is at least some indication that this approach is superior to what's been used in the past, and I'll try and describe some of that in more detail in a few minutes. But I want to start by showing situations where the smoothing mesh code actually gets good agreement with the smooth particle hydrodynamics code gadget and try and explain to you why, at least in certain situations, these two very different approaches seem to get very similar kinds of results. So the first is looking at a, an interaction between two galaxies in isolation and their subsequent merger. All right, so these are two gas-rich disks that encounter one another. They lose orbital energy due to dynamical friction and eventually coalesce into a single object. Now, what can happen in events like this is that if these disks contain gas, gravitational torques during the course of the interaction can cause a lot of the gas to collapse into the center and produce a strong burst of star formation there. And that has the consequence of modifying the profile of the, the remnant that's left over and also possibly explaining things like ultraluminous and direct analyses used nearby starburst the galaxies that show intense star formation in their centers. So we've done these simulations using both types of codes, Arapo and Gadget. This is a, a plot showing the star formation rate versus time. When the galaxies first pass by one another, there's an elevated, brief elevated period of star formation. And when they finally coalesce, there's a strong burst due to the fact that a lot of gas is driven to the center during the final coalescence of these galaxies. This plot shows the mass of newly formed stars versus time since the beginning of the simulation. And there are actually two curves here. <coughs> the solid one is with Gadget, and the dashed dotted one is with Arapo. And you can see in this case that the results are essentially identical. 
So at least in certain situations, smooth part of hydrodynamics and a smoothly mesh code give results that are essentially equivalent. And I would say this is a non-trivial problem with these two objects moving around. Fixed grid codes have not been able to attack this sort of problem in the past because of the difficulty of having the computational expense focused in a small fraction of the volume. But here's a case where the two codes agree quite well. Here's another one. And this has to do with this phenomenon called the line alpha quarks, which is a series of absorption features in a spectrum of distant quasars. So starting in the 1990s, a new picture developed how these absorption features originate. Suppose that there's a bright source, a quasar, at some great distance, and we look at it here on the Earth. Light from this quasar will pass through the intergalactic medium, and this intergalactic medium will be distributed inhomogeneously because the material is arranged in filamentary structures, this pattern called the cosmic web. As the light from this quasar re um, encounters gas at different overdensity, more or less of it will be scattered due to resonant line alpha scattering. And if you produce a simulated uh, spectrum from um, what would happen when the light passes through this region, you would end up with something that looks like that. So absorption feature is characteristic of the local density of neutral hydrogen at different regions as the light passes through um, this intergalactic web. Okay, this shows the comparison of the real quasar spectrum, and at least by eye, they look very similar, and statistically, they agree very well. So we think this is how the line of the forest originates. So we've done simulations comparing our own gadget to this particular problem. These plots here show the probability distribution of the transmitted flux versus flux. Okay, so this means uh, regions that are transparent, these are regions that are mostly opaque. The curves are at different redshifts and show results using um, the two different codes. And it's a little bit hard to see because it's not very dark here, but basically the results agree very well. And so another situation where the two codes give identical, essentially equivalent results. Okay, now there are good reasons why the two codes should agree in those particular circumstances. Okay, this moving mesh code solved the equation more accurately than the smooth particle hydrodynamics does. SPH entails certain approximations in how it deals with estimating local quantities like the density and pressure gradients. But in these particular cases, those approximations don't affect the solution greatly. And the reason for that is that in these applications, the motion of the gas is largely determined by gravity, which is calculated in the same way in both codes. And so this means that slight, slight errors that are made in the short range forces are subdominant and don't affect the solution very much. Furthermore, the physical state of the gas is fairly simple. The gas is mainly expanding or contracting, and shear in the gas is relatively less important. And so these are the reasons why the two codes are pretty well and why for these applications, SPH is perfectly capable of giving reasonable answers. However, it turns out if we look at the cosmological context, things are more complicated. And in particular, in regions near cosmological halos, the gas can exist in a variety of phases that are interacting with one another. And in those circumstances, SPH starts to have problems. OK, so here's an example of what I mean. So this is showing simulations, cosmological simulations done with moving mesh code and with SPH. This is a slice through a box at redshift 2. So on large scales, the gas, this is the projected gas density on the top. The gas just traces out the filamentary structure of the dark matter, which dictates the motion of the gas on large scales. And then as we go down, it's showing progressive zoom-ins on this region here, and then finally this region on the bottom. This is the temperature and density at that scale, and then the same things on a small scale shown. You can see with this moving mesh code that at the center of this dark matter halo, there's a rotationally supported disk, and I'll show further examples of this in a second. Whereas with this smooth particle hydrogenamus code, this disk is less well defined and has a very clumpy appearance to it. So this kind of outcome has been conventionally obtained for the past 20 years or more. We get a very different kind of outcome using this moving mesh code, and we like to understand why we see these differences. Okay, so this is not a particular 
on a special case. These show caisson views of a number of different disks in one of these cosmological simulations. These are shown in Redshift 2. But you'd see pretty similar things in Redshift 0. Okay, these are the galaxies that were obtained using this moving mesh code. You can see face on that they are um, nice looking disks. And if you look at them edge on, they're very thin. If you look at the same objects with gadget, this is what you see. So going back and forth, you can see in all cases that the disks that we get with this moving mesh code are more extended and more regular in appearance. Okay, so in many cases with SPH, you end up with an outcome like that, where you end up with a bunch of disconnected blobs rather than something that looks like a rotationally supported disk. And so this is the kind of outcome that's traditionally been gotten in studies of this type over the past 20 years or so. And we're seeing significant differences just due to the um, change in the hydrodynamic solver alone. Now, if we compare statistically the objects that result using these two approaches, it turns out that the galaxies that we see with this moving mesh approach are more disk-like. They're more spatially extended. So here's an example of this. We fitted exponential profiles to the disks that we got in the two um, solutions. This is the exponential scaling versus halo mass. The blue line is the result of ARPO and the yellow line is the one with gadget. And so there are systematic offsets at the level of a factor of two or three and how extended these disks are. Furthermore, with this moving mesh code, the surface density profiles are more exponential and more regular, so more characteristic of what galaxies actually look like. And furthermore, this is also reflected in the amount of angular momentum that the baryons in these disks contain. So this seems to be a significant advance over what's been done previously. But I, I should emphasize that this is not yet a solution to the problem of forming disks cosmologically. And the reason for that is that these objects that we end up with, even in the case of this moving mesh code, are too massive in baryons for the dark matter payloads we're <laughs> sitting in. And the reason for that is that these simulations haven't yet accounted for processes that would drive outflows in these galaxies which we know have to be included eventually, and which are definitely present in real galaxies. So this is not really a solution yet to the problem of cosmological disformation, but it may be a step in the right direction. So in the local case, what, by what fraction do we this to them? By what fraction? So they're overmassive by a factor of about two or three. So there has to be some process that would either prevent gas from falling into these halos, cooling and collapsing out of these disks, or if it gets there, there has to be some process that would drive it out back into the empty black medium. And we don't really know what the answer is to this, but the best bet seems to be that there are processes happening that would drive strong winds from the galaxies and drive a lot of the material out of course from the stars. And possibly that outflow material would interact with the material falling in, preventing that infalling material from reaching the galaxy. Okay, there are other differences in addition to the appearance of these individual galaxies. So, for example, if we look at the total average star formation happening in a large cosmological box, that's shown here, the cosmic star formation rate versus look back time. So this is the present, and this is an early time. The blue curve was with Aripo, and the uh, yellow was with Gadget. You can see that the star formation rate, especially <coughs> at lower times, is higher with this moving mesh code. And it turns out that these differences are most noticeable in most massive halos. And because of this, it means that the galaxies that are forming contain even more cold baryons than you would get with the smooth part of the and so that further exacerbates the need for some sort of feedback process that would prevent the gas from cooling onto the galaxies in the first place. And I, I said that this difference is most noticeable in most massive galaxies. So this shows the star emission rate versus halo mass. The blue, again, is with the moving mesh, and the yellow with smooth part of the hydrodynamics. This is a redshift 2, this is a redshift 0. 
you can see the star commission rate is systematically higher in these more massive objects. That has the net effect of producing more stars in the most massive galaxies. So this shows the uh, stellar mass function versus um, stellar mass. And this shows the result of Carico, this with gadget. And so the more massive galaxies are more common with the smoothing mesh code than with the smooth part of the commands code. So we already had a problem with the SPA simulations of the galaxies containing too many stars in the end. And so this makes it worse. And so whatever feedback processes operate to regulate the amount of star emission happening, they have to be accounted for even more so with these moving mass simulations. Now, why does this happen? So what this shows is the net cooling versus heating rate as a function of redshift average over all halos. And the blue curve lies above. This means that the gas in the halos is cooling more efficiently in the moving mass simulations than in the smooth particle hydrodynamics ones. So we believe that there are artifacts in the SPH simulations that are causing the gas, the fuse, diffuse gas in the halos to be too hot, preventing it from cooling as efficiently as it should. And I'll try and motivate how that might be happening in a few minutes. OK, so we see these systematic differences. We believe that the moving mesh simulations are more realistic, more accurate, but we like to understand why we're seeing these differences rather than just pointing them out. And so what we've done to try and understand them is to do idealized tests in very simplified situations to see what sort of differences might arise and whether or not those could explain these differences <coughs> that we see in these cosmological simulations. So here's an example of this. It's a well-known test that was done first by Agrix and Collaborators in 2007. It does not include self-gravity. And what it shows is a blob of dense gas plowing through more diffuse medium. Okay, so this blob is moving in that direction. Initially, there was a pressure equilibrium with the surroundings. Okay, as it moves through this uh, diffuse gas, a bow shock develops. And this is the solution that we get with this moving mesh code. Basically, what happens is that the interface between this cold dense gas and the surrounding hot diffuse gas is unstable to Kelvin Helmholtz and Rayleigh Taylor instabilities. And the effect of those instabilities is to cause this block to disrupt and eventually mix very efficiently with the surrounding diffuse material. This is the solution we get with gadget smooth particle hydrodynamics code. As I mentioned at the beginning, these codes don't resolve contact discontinuities very well. And that has the effect of suppressing these fluid instabilities, like Kevin Thomas and Rayleigh really Taylor instabilities. And so you can see what happens in this case is that this block does not get dispersed. It doesn't mix up very um, quickly. It remains largely intact. And these frames are shown in um, separations of time of order the time scale for which the Calvin Hamill sensibility should become nonlinear. So by this time, we think that this is more representative of what should happen in reality, that these blobs of gas should be dispersed due to these small scale instabilities. Now, we've tested this idea in progressively more complicated situations that are more representative of the cosmological setting. Can you go back one slide? Sure. You mentioned earlier that there was a second order convergence. So if you know the convergence test on your other whole simulation, you find that indeed the uh, you find the expected convergence pretty Yeah, for this one, yeah, so it, it does converge the way that you expect. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there is no corresponding conversion criterion for gadget for a number of technical reasons. And so we haven't tried to push this to very high resolution. Mm -hmm. I should point out that there have been attempts to add modifications to SPH to make it work better in these circumstances. So Daniel Price, for example, has advocated putting in an artificial thermal conductivity into SPH that allows it to better handle interfaces between um, different phases of gas like this. And we haven't attempted to do that because those sorts of changes have not been made in SPH codes have been used in cosmology. And furthermore, I'm not very enthusiastic about those sorts of modifications because they're purely ad hoc. 
and it's unclear what effect an artificial thermal conductivity might have in other circumstances. You know, so there may be ways to make SPH behave better under these circumstances, but at least the kinds of changes that have been proposed to date are very ad hoc in my opinion. Okay, so this is basically the same thing as the previous test, but in a slightly more cosmologically relevant situation. So what we did here was to have a dark matter halo represented by a fixed potential. In this potential, we added diffuse gas and hydrostatic equilibrium, so it's just sitting there. And then we put in a bunch of orbiting dense blobs of gas, initially in pressure equilibrium with their surroundings. And these blobs of gas don't include dark matter halos. I'll show a generalization of this in a second. And furthermore, the diffuse gas was not allowed to cool and didn't have any net rotation. Okay, so these blobs are just orbiting around. This is the um, outcome with this moving mesh code. And you can see what happens is that due to these hydrodynamic instabilities, these blobs start to get dispersed. As they lose mass, the dynamical friction on them is less efficient. And so they tend to orbit around in the outskirts, eventually be destroyed, and mix their um, low energy material with the surrounding higher energy gas, that's um, diffuse gas. With gadget, these things don't suffer the stripping that they should. They sink to the center very efficiently due to dynamical friction because they retain most of their mass. And they eventually end up at the center depositing um, low energy gas there. <coughs> now, at the beginning, I mentioned this comparison that had been done in 1999 where there was noted a systematic offset between the entropy profiles in this cluster of simulation between grid codes and um, particle-based codes. We think we understand now why that difference happens. So basically, it's due to the fact that with these grid codes, mixing between different phases of gas occurs very naturally, as it ought to, whereas with these particle-based codes, it's suppressed due to the fact that these codes don't resolve um, discontinuities very accurately or boundaries between gas at different phases. So what happens here is that these cold blocks sink to the center, deposit a lot of low entropy gas there, and then if we look at the entropy profile versus radius at the end, the particle-based solution is this tan curve here, whereas with this grid code, we get this blue curve. So we think we understand now why this offset is seen in these simulations from 1999. And we believe it's due to artifacts with these particle-based codes that don't allow um, gas of different phases to mix together as efficiently as they should. And so low entropy material ends up in the center artificially, whereas it should be mixed up at larger distances, and the um, higher entropy cores should um, be more representative of what would really happen in a situation like this. Now we've further generalized a simple test. So this is, again, supposed to be more representative of these cosmological situations. So again, this shows a dark matter halo represented by a fixed potential. We put gas into this um, dark matter potential, diffuse gas, again, initially in hydrostatic equilibrium. But this time, we added some number of to the gas. And we also allowed this diffuse gas to cool radiatively. Then on top of that, we added a number of orbiting sub halos, so dark matter halos, each having some gas in them. So they're indicated um, by these small blobs here. Now, what we see with this solution with this moving mesh code is that gas gets stripped out of these sub halos due to interactions between that gas and the diffuse gas surrounding on them. The gas is stripped out through these hydrodynamical instabilities and eventually gets mixed up with diffuse gas at large distances. As the diffuse gas cools, it starts to form a rotational supported disk at the center. And so we end up with something that looks like a nice face on rotational supported disk of gas. What happens in these particle based simulations is quite different. The gas in these subhalos doesn't get stripped out very efficiently. These things tend to sink into the middle, depositing low angular momentum gas there. Right? In this case, the gas is stripped out of large distances and retains total angular momentum. And so when that gas cools onto the center, it still has a lot of angular momentum in it. 
But in this case, that doesn't happen. The gas loses its angular momentum and gets deposited at the middle. And so you end up with a situation where there's a much more compact object at the center with a few more orbiting um, side tables still left, very representative of what we see in these cosmological simulations. And so we think that one of the reasons we see these differences is due to the fact that gas stripping is not handled properly in these particle-based studies. Now I mentioned also that we saw these differences in the heating and cooling rates in the diffuse gas in the dark matter halos. We think that's related to a different kind of problem having to do with small errors that are made in some of the local fluid quantities and the particle-based techniques that don't show up in the moving mass simulations. And so this issue was investigated recently by Volker Springle and Andreas Bauer. What they did was to study turbulence in very idealized settings. Okay, so this is a, a box with periodic boundaries. And what they did was to force turbulence in it by driving it on very large scales and then allowing it to relax um, into some sort of steady state. Okay, so this shows um, the turbulent velocity field, turbulent density field, and a measure of the vorticity. This is after some period of time where this um, system has roughly achieved a steady state. This is the solution with this moving mesh code. This is the solution with a fixed mesh by comparison. And this is what you get with smooth particle hydrodynamics. In this particular circumstance, this turbulence was subsonic. And you can see that the errors that are made in things like the pressure gradients locally have the effect of washing out the small scale turbulence. Okay, we think this is related to this issue of suppression of cooling in the halos, that this turbulence is suppressed and dissipated on larger scales than it ought to be. And that has the effect of acting as a heat reservoir, heating the gas artificially, preventing it from cooling. Now, unfortunately, this is a, a kind of situation where these sorts of differences occur in some situations, but not others. Okay, so this is the case of subsonic turbulence. This is what happens if the turbulence is drive supersonically instead. This is the moving mesh, the fixed mesh, and now this is what you get with SPH. And in this case, things look much better. And the reason for that is that in the case of supersonic turbulence, most of the energy is in kinetic energy, and errors made in the local quantities like density and pressure gradients are subdominant. And so here we can get a perfectly good solution with smooth particle hydrodynamics, unlike the subsonic case where these small scale errors throughout the solution completely. Okay, I wanted just to mention a, a couple of other things that we've been looking at um, most recently before I quit. One has to do with something that uh, has become very popular in the past six or seven years in cosmological simulations. The idea that gas can be delivered into the centers of payloads in some sort of cold form rather than being shot in the outskirts of dark matter payloads. Okay, this idea has been popularized by simulations like this. Um, this is from a paper by Duchamp Paris and collaborators from three years ago. And what it shows is the distribution of gas at redshift two and at redshift one in a particular halo whose redshift zero mass is 10 to 12. Okay, this is a temperature scale. There's a lot of shock gas, it's very hot. But on top of that, there appear to be these cold filaments of gas plunging into the centers of these halos. Okay, so this is showing a cold gas only. You can see there's an indication that these cold filaments actually extend to the very center of the halo, possibly delivering a lot of cold gas there directly without it having to be shocked, shocked heated, and eventually cooling onto the central object. These simulations were done with SPH. In fact, they were done with Gadget. And based on recent tests that we've been doing, we have some reason to suspect that these may be at least partly due to numerical artifacts that this technique may not be real. And in fact, there are a number of other problems with SPH that I haven't mentioned up to now. For example, things like um, the gas can often exhibit artificial clumping when it shouldn't. And furthermore, because shocks tend to be broadened with this technique, gas can actually experience cooling as it passes through the shock when it shouldn't, if the shock is actually a sharp discontinuity. 
And so this is an illustration of this. These are tests that were done with um, Gadget and with Harapo. This shows a particular halo at redshift one. And so the halo is roughly here, and then this is the surrounding intergalactic medium. This is the projected gas density that you get with highly resolved simulation with Gadget, SPH. You can see these um, cold uh, streamers extending all the way to the center, and a large number of clumps of gas orbiting around in the halo, many of which collapse onto the central forming object. This is the same object simulated with Arapo. You can see a lot of these streamers are simply gone, and there are none of these clumps that would um, present in the halo that might sink into the center. So we're seeing significant systematic differences between <coughs> solutions gotten with SPH versus this moving mesh. And we have good reason to believe that a lot of the structure is purely artificial due to some of the problems with SPH. And so at this point, we still have a lot of work to do on this, but I have to say I'm quite skeptical about this whole picture of cold flows feeding the formation of galaxies and dark matter halos. Okay, so. Can you comment on warps? What's that? Can you comment on warps? Dwarf galaxies? Well, the incidence of dwarf, uh, dark dwarfs. So, um, this is kind of a misleading picture. So this is showing the projected gas density. And it turns out that a lot of these clumps here don't have dark matter payloads. They're just clumps of gas. And so the reason for this is that there's um, hot diffuse gas surrounding the central object in this dark matter payload. These cold streams are flowing in. And STH tries to allow Kelvin Kummel's type instabilities to develop. But rather than allowing this polar gas to mix with the surrounding diffuse gas, instead the vortices that are produced start to fragment apart into these blobs. And so these blobs are occurring basically at the resolution scale of the simulation. So that's why they appear. Now you see a number of objects here in the moving mass simulation. These are actually small subhalos that contain gas. And whether or not we can come up with some way of explaining the missing satellite problems based on purely hydrogenatical effects is unclear. And it could be that if we, um, if these, if these simulations represent gas stripping more properly than some of the earlier simulations have, that maybe some of these satellites will eventually become dark just because the gas is stripped out. But of course, that will depend upon the interplay between the star formation happening and the, and the rate at which the gas is stripped out. So I simply don't know what the answer to that would be yet. Okay, so let me just uh, finish by mentioning where this work is going in the future. And so what we want to do next is to do much larger simulations in boxes that are around 100 megaparsecs across with around 2,000 cubed particles of cell and cells. We've started um, these runs already. This is a, a relative zero representation of the first run that we've done, which includes only dark matter. We're going to do these simulations in increasing complexity of the gas physics, but starting from the same initial conditions. So we can compare objects and see how they're affected by different treatments of the gas physics. So the next one we're going to do will be to include gas that don't allow to radiate, so it'll be aviate that and decide to shock um, heating. And then finally do a run where we include some treatment of all these different physical processes that ultimately need to be accounted for, like properties of the star forming gas, trying to account for feedback and outflows to galaxies in some simple approximate way. Ultimately, what we want to do is to try and refine these sorts of models. And the way that we're going to do that is based on, for example, work recently done by Bill Hopkins, Elliot Porter, and Norm Murray, where they tried to model explicitly the structure of star forming ISM and all the feedback processes that we think might be operating. And it'll be impractical to do this in the full cosmological box, but our, um, what we'll try to do is to zoom in on select objects and look at those objects at very high resolution, getting down to roughly a parsec or so, including all these different physical processes, and hopefully use those sorts of simulations to formulate better sub-resolution modeling that we can use in entire cosmological volume objects. Okay, so to summarize, 
trying to solve galaxy formation and galaxy evolution cosmologically. It's a very difficult problem. And in particular, if we want to do this numerically, we have to use adaptive techniques. And there have been a number of successes over the past 20, 25 years using focus <coughs> neutron hydrodynamics and AMR type codes. However, these techniques each have their own limitations, and that's motivated this new approach based on this move and match code, Arapo, which tries to combine together the best features of SPH and AMR code to the extent possible to eliminate their weaknesses. And in particular, this code retains, say, the geometric flexibility of smooth particle hydrodynamics codes, but it also has very limited diffusivity, like adaptive mesh refinement codes do, because it doesn't use things like artificial viscosity to describe discontinuities. And so it allows for a very accurate handling of shock waves and discontinuities at interfaces between fluids of different phases, enabling it to handle fluid instabilities uh, correctly and accurately. And so I think the re results that I described today, while preliminary, are promising and may allow us to obtain in the near future a technique for actually understanding galaxy formation and evolution for first principles. Thank you. These kinds of filamentary structures don't appear, but the gas that actually ends up um, in these halos is cooling at a more rapid rate than the gas that's present in these halos here. And that's due to small-scale errors that um, SPH makes that keeps the diffused gas hot and prevents it from cooling as efficiently as it should. Now, so it looks like there are a lot of um, cold blocks here, but they're actually fairly low in mass. So the overall net cooling rate is actually higher here, but the gas is cooling contains more angular momentum than it does in my case. Is it that you don't expect cold flows to be important in general, or, or just that it's less than it was shown by its rate? So I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, if I had to make a guess, I would, I would say that there would be less important in general and not necessarily completely um, absent. You know, you, you can't, it's a little bit hard to see um, in this image, but there are indications that there are some filamentary structures attempting to come into this halo. They don't arrive at the very center. And so I think the main outcome will be that this way of doing it simply doesn't capture the angular momentum content of the accretive gas correctly. And that's one of the reasons that these SPH time simulations haven't given things that look like rotationally supported disks. Whereas here, the cold gas mixes much more efficiently with the hot surrounding diffuse gas, retaining its angular momentum. And I think that's another reason why we see objects that are more rotationally supported with this kind of approach than with this particle disk technique. I see. So the gas that on the Arepo one, it, it is shock heated around the burial radius before it falls in. Some of it is. Some of it just comes in um, still in fairly cold form, but then it gets dispersed due to hydrodynamical instabilities and mixed up with the surrounding gas. In other words, here what happens to it is that this gas tends to fragment into blobs on the resolution scale of the simulation. These blobs don't have any dark matter. If they orbit around, eventually sink to the center, providing a lot of low, cold, low angular momentum material to the central forming object, and which is unphysical. And so I think these kinds of simulations, partly for this reason, are not capable of correctly describing how rotational supported disks form cosmological. Are the dark matter halos 
So um, that's something that we haven't really looked at in detail yet. But yes, I think the different distribution of the baryons will affect the surrounding dark matter in terms of the shapes of the dark matter halos and their density profiles. And that's something that we're just starting to look into now with these basic simulations that we're doing. Are there no further questions? Let's take slides again.